Welcome to part two of London's Finishing School on Violence with Lee Morrison. Now, part one, we covered the whole idea of, you know, growing up in a violent background, how he was able to turn that and start building these concepts that he learned through not only just martial arts, but also practical street smarts that he had because he had to survive. And then what he learned working the doors of some of the seediest clubs in London. And again, it's a whole other world of uh, being a bouncer and during those years in London when, uh, when Lee was a bouncer. So before we get into it, though, please subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell, please share it with your friends. And also, while you're doing that, please also go to surviveviolence.com, sign up for the free masterclass. Again, it's the way to keep in touch with us, get the latest information. And it's a great way for you to share this information with your friends. And they get a lot of great free content right up front. We never sell the information, but it really helps us to stay in touch with you and give you the latest information. So thanks for that. Now, getting back into this, I think what's really interesting is we started, you know, at the, at the end of part one, Lee started to talk about his concept of creating the tier one individual, you know, and that's something that, uh, that people... Uh, might misconstrue. Tier one is is what we use in the in the military uh, to talk about the group. In the United States, a tier one group is usually directed directly from the president. Uh, they can go into battle right away. They they are the best of the best. And there's many different groups in tier one. And Lee's concept, because of his work with the military and, and being around those uh, those types of individuals. You know, in this day and age, he's evolved to the point to where he really feels like. You know, that's what we need to become. You need to be a tier one civilian. And he explains that. He also explains the difference between the restrictions that the UK has on, uh, you know, using weapons and how they're able to use uh, self-protection methods and the U.S. It's pretty interesting to hear that part of the conversation. That's what got me in a lot of trouble, you know, when I was over there, when uh, we would talk about things. I would just suggest some changes and uh, the kickback was just huge. Um, whenever I would suggest anything like that, but it's interesting to hear it from Lee's perspective. So, uh, with no further ado, let's get into it. Here is part two of London's finishing school on violence. I love that term. Would be to implement a physical skill set immediately that would disrupt your ability to fight, which means I'm either going to take your consciousness, your fucking air, your breathing, your vision, your mobility, or all. If I take one, two or more of these things, I'll reliably take your will to continue. You won't want no more part of me. So that's the unarmed skills. How do the unarmed skills change? They don't change. Pulse starts the same, fucking elbows the same, hammer fists the same, I'm smashing you in the throat, the same. All that would change would be target choice. All that would change would be target choice. So if I, you know, if, I, if I punch you in the chin, I'll knock you out. If I punch you in the throat, I'll fucking kill you because I collapse your airway. So target choice may differ. Where does that belong? Well, context is always dictation of content. So if I was to start a tier one civilian seminar, I might start it like this. I might say, look, you're gonna learn very high level grade unarmed skills, which simply means a shift in targeting. Rather than know how to control or subdue somebody, you need to, of course, know how to render somebody unconscious. You need to take it a notch further just out of an act of sheer desperation, if there was no other choice, you need to know how to end somebody unarmed. And really that becomes a targeting choice because if I slam you on the ground and I stamp on your calf, you've got a cruel to catch me. But if I slam you into the pavement and now I stamp on the back of your brainstem, it's over. So where would that belong? Like I said, context dictates content. Well, imagine an armed home invasion. So in the UK alone, during the first lockdown, there was about three that I saw, read about, there was probably more. And if, you know, everybody was at home, including dad, the brothers, the normal lads that would be out were at home and still there was armed home invasions. One of them fatal. Well, imagine three o'clock in the morning, three armed men breaking in your house. And you're there on your own because they've breached out of perimeter security. They've breached the threshold security, which means now the only thing left between your family and those you love is you stood in front of them with whatever you've got in your hand and the fucking willingness to use it. The last layer of security stops with you. And of course, the majority of males these days have purposely been beta bred. 
have been pacified with too much soya lattes and fucking man buns. The old hunter-gatherer person that wants to stand up and be willing to fight for his family is not really the most common thing in vogue right now. Then the likes of me are gone, mate. They're gone. But I digress. The point is, imagine somebody did break in and they're armed. And you've gone to the ground with them. You're struggling. You've messed it down. You can get up now. And you see the other two are fits on the light and they're dragging your wife somewhere. Well, I need to make sure that this fucker doesn't get up ever again. I can't just stamp on his ankle and let him fucking pop up like Zebedee. I need to crush his fucking brainstem and end him. Because in the context of that, if I don't do that, I don't get to my wife. So... I'll start a seminar and I'll say, you're going to learn unarmed skills. You're also going to learn how to use any point and edged weapon. Small fruit knife size, concealable, uh, where legality allows you to carry it out. Understand, I teach UC in over 40 countries, including third world countries. In many countries, there's different legal laws in relation to carrying of weapons. But the tier one civilian in the UK would learn good unarmed skills, would learn how to use a point and edge tool, and would learn how to use an impact weapon for blood force trauma. So any time a stick-like structure that's solid, but also something flexible, so think rock in a sock. So that is where our combative skills stop, unless, of course, you have the uh, capacity to shoot, because you do all show learn how to shoot. So a tier one civilian would know good unarmed skills, would know how to use a point and edge weapon, would know how to use an impact for blunt force trauma weapon, would know how to improvise any weapon of opportunity, and they can shoot. So I used to shoot when I was away all the time. And here all I can do is airsoft and cert gun. But trust me, I'm dry firing. I'm doing it. So if you do from a combative point of view, tier one civilian would need these skills. Got it? Got it. In addition to that, I would suggest that you know um, emergency combat casualty care. So you know how to apply a tourniquet. You know how to wound pack. You know how to deal with a collapsed lung. That sort of shit. Anything that can happen in the onslaught of a shooting, an active threat, a stabbing, a bombing, a car wreck. You know, have the ability and the capacity to know how to save life. And that's where EDC comes in. So everyday carry. Well, if you're serious about that, you should have some items on you that would be useful. You don't have to go geek squad, but you should have a tourniquet. You should have an improvised weapon. You should have comms. You should have means. And if you've got a vehicle, you should have a kit in your car. And this is what I said, where, you know, you, you guys in the States have a big jump on us because you've got access to firearms, you've got access to great medical kit, you've got access to great training. So what I would suggest for your people now where, where you are, because let's face it, right? So a tier one civilian has all these skills. He also maybe has some skills for counter custody. So imagine being taken lawfully, unlawfully, in a third world country, kidnapped. Do you know how to break zip ties? Do you know how to use uh, non-friction methods to get out? Do you know how to um, use friction to break zip ties? Do you know how to, to this kind of stuff right. like, related to counter custody is one skill. And there's many other myriad of skills that you get through grid went down. You're caught in an urban environment. Would you know where to find water? You're caught out in a suburban environment. You've got any bushcraft skills. All of these skills cumulatively would make you a much more capable citizen. And that's what the tier one civilian idea is. And that's where my UC is going. So out of all the schools and study groups that I've got in the States, or globally rather, I've got quite a few in the States and every one of my people there are on the same page. And the reason they're on the same page is because there's a higher potential with what's going on now that we could have a, a period of civil unrest. There's a high uh, probability right now, there will plausibility at least, that for some days maybe, somewhat, we could become lawless. If they start fucking with the food and making a food shortage, people start getting worried about getting hungry to get fucking crazy. So I don't need to tell you that people across the states are, you know, like-minded people are already forming, you know, mutual assistance groups where, you know, if we end up in the shit, how do we protect each other? Who's doing what? Well, they're nowhere near organised over here like that. Over here, they haven't got a fucking clue. Most of the sheep are not even awake as to what can happen. But there's a high probability that with what is going on now and where this current situation is going, if something is not done about it, is that with the lifetime that all of us have left, there's a high probability you could face a level 10 threat. So what's a level 10 threat? A level 10 threat is where you are faced with potential deadly force. Any force offered to you that could create grievous bodily harm and or your death. 
And let's face it, that's any situation that you could find yourself in nowadays. You, you know, you have a, a fender bender and the guy gets out, you know, there's a chance he might fucking stab you. That's how it is now. It's getting crazy. People have lost respect for human life. So there's a need if you really want to protect your family for you to become skilled. And the tier one civilian idea is the evolvement, if you like, of where you see us now. So I started with you right at the beginning, upbringing dictated this mentality. Upbringing in me dictated my understanding our self-preservation needs of how predator operates and how you might deal with the same. In order to deal with any predatory presence that you can't avoid or de-escalate you need to be worse than them <laughs> and bottom line is bad people hurt bad people bad people hurt good people and if you want to deal with bad people you've got no bad so primarily i'm a benevolent being you know I cry sad films i help old ladies across the street i love little kids and puppy dogs but you corner me as a cornered animal i'll steal your fucking face and the reason for that is i must go on I'm too important to lose, not because I'm a hot shit. I'm too important in my belief system because so many people need me and I need them. Like fuck with some miscreant in the street or whatever, take me away from those I love. I'll end him or I'll die doing it. So that's the mentality. And combatis is at the extreme end of the self-protection scale, which is designed to deal with that. It's designed for a real level 10 threat. If you're facing a significant threat that could end your life and take your significant others, you know? So you need to have a level 10 response. Now, does that mean, of course, that you would respond that way in every situation? Of course not. Because now I've got a multi-tool. It's not a, everything looks like a nail and all I've got is a hammer. If I approach any situation that's problematic in a violent sense then my mentality as i enter into the fray whether i'm proactive or reactive will be prepared for a level 10 use of violence which means i am prepared to end you without a doubt but if inside of that the violence volume control dictates that you're not the threat i deemed you were so example, let's say that somebody is about to give me a significant problem and in this particular moment, I've decided to clinch him and put three knees into him and then bounce his head off the fucking pavement because I feel if he don't do that, he's going to pull out that blade and he's going to harpoon me with it. And he's got two friends over there that look pretty fucking game too. So a high potential situation. Well, if I'm going to face that and I have to engage it, in my mindset, that's the willingness I'm, I'm willing to go to. I'm going to clinch, knee, snatch, and stomp the back of your fucking head and then be ready for the next cunt that steps up. That's how I will enter the afraid mentally. But if inside of that, and I'll give you an example from real experience, this person threatening to kill me, blah, 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 and all the rest of it, led me to believe via a knife-based threat, which was, I'm going to fucking open you up like a sardine can as he's walking forward. He's basically telling me he's carrying a weapon. My head was, I'm going to end him, put him down before he ends me. The second I concussively clinched him and pulled him in, he was semi-conscious. He felt like cream cheese. And he wasn't what he thought he was. And so he was actually semi-conscious when I concussively clinched, because I clinched very concussively. So imagine a tight clinch is just grab the head. We don't do that. I hit the side of the neck, back of the brainstem, back of the brainstem, and I bring your face straight into my shoulder as I clinch. That's a split second before my knee puts your testicles in your tonsils. All I had to do with this particular individual was clinch him and he collapsed. So in that moment, I realized that I don't need to go beyond the level of force and I turned my level of force down. So think about it as a violence volume dial. Zero would be nothing. One or two might be you know, a de-escalation and a push. Three to five or six required me to preemptively strike or do one thing, but seven, eight, nine, ten required me to keep going and put an end to you. When I enter this affray mentally, I'm ready to instantaneously access ten. I have to have the ability in my emotional content, if you've selected me already as potential prey, then your mindset is predatory. And if you deem me prey on the preparation to use violence dial, this person is probably around eight or nine, where the average target that he's selected that's oblivious to anything I've just said is probably on zero to one in terms of their preparation to use violence.
But if I see him coming and I'm aware of him, I'm going to implement a non-violent posture that's going to allow me to momentarily protect the gap between us while I assess this situation. But in that moment, I'm on zero in terms of preparation to use violence, but the second you hit the switch, I will go to 10. I must have a switch in my brain that will allow me to leapfrog past where you are psychologically in terms of your preparation to hurt me, that will allow me to eclipse your level of force. I want people to think about it really, it's, it's, this can be this clinical. So I'll give you a door example. I had to deal with two individuals on the door. I had three further people waiting in the car park and a whole load of lads at another pub that were willing to come down. And they were threatening to come in and smash the fuck out of everybody, wreck the place, blah, blah, blah. Right? So they were preventive, um, uh, uh, offering, uh, threatening a real high level of carnage and violence. Well, I had both of them, boom, boom, one in the chin and the other in the chin, and they both fucking went out. Now, that wasn't a usual result for me. It happened, but usually my primary thing was hit, grab, and repeatedly hit. So most of the knockouts I've achieved come from uh, um, continuous attack, if you like, uh, continuous effect, a cumulative effect. Hit you, you're semi-conscious, bam, 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 now you're fucking out. Right? But these, it, just, it was just peachy, it was Christmas, it was just bang, bang, both of them unconscious down. Well, I used a minimal amount of violence, in this case, two preemptive strikes, to prevent a huge amount of violence. Right. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Because a lot of people have a problem with hitting first. Well, oh, you probably instigated it because you hit first. Well, they were unconscious, they didn't instigate anything. If you wait for confirmation that you are under assault, that confirmation will come via the assault, which means you are sustaining injury now and you've lost valuable time because time under fight stress is damage. If I fuck around and wait for you to confirm that you're going to pull that knife out and stab me, guess what the confirmation will be? It'll be you stabbing me and me dead. Right. Whereas right. if I understand this behavior, I understand pre threat cue, I understand what it means when your elbow pops and your hand disappears behind you. If I recognize that for what it is, I'm going to take clinical primitive action right now. And by knocking you out unconsciously as you put your hand on your own knife to attempt to stab me, I prevented further violence. But a lot of people are being you know, pacified and can't get over the idea of being first. But I can't accentuate to you enough. It's, it's the what works most reliably. And if you were in a situation where you, know, you, you had to engage a lethal threat, so let's example. This is the level that I'm talking about. So I have uh, very proficient on arm skills, blade skills. I can shoot and I can use impact weapons. I can use anything. But the primary tool that I'll implement is this. So I will strive, but the objective of somebody that was a tier one civilian type of trainee is, is that you could find yourself in a very high threat situation, but remain calm and confident enough to stay cognitive. So although you know, my heart rate's increasing, I've got, if there's, if there's pre-time, you've seen a situation unfolding because you're switched on, then I can breathe and keep my heart rate under control. I can stay cognitive. As opposed to suddenly something happens and now boom, I'm shocked and my heart rate escalates beyond fucking 145 beats per minute. Blood's now withdrawn from all arms and legs to go to the hearts and lungs where it's needed most. And it's also withdrawn from my neocortex at the front of my brain. And now I become limbic brain where I'm only capable of feeling because the fight or flight response has just kicked in. I don't want that. That's the average citizen. Yeah? I want the ability to recognize that the threat's happening but control my physiological and chemical cocktail to a degree where I can stay cognitive enough to act without overreacting or underreacting. And that applies in a fight dynamic. That implies in a situation where, let's say, there's been an explosion. You've got your family to safety and your little girl's got a piece of shrapnel in ephemeral. You want to have the ability to keep your fucking mindset in your core so you can apply, self-apply a tourniquet to her or improvise a tourniquet, stop the bleeding and get her to a hospital. Yeah, you imagine that. You know, someone you love with more than anything bleeding out in front of you in that panic. Well, a tier one civilian would be somebody that could, in that moment control that emotional response and apply something that's going to save a life. So that's just one example. And that's an example of where the mindset is so important for an incident like that, you know, administering first aid and stopping massive blood loss. 
That's the same as controlling your fear so you keep it together so you can engage in a violent dynamic in order to protect what's behind you. So I don't allow it to debilitate me to the point where I'm frozen and I capitulate. So the mindset is so fucking important. I can't reiterate it enough. 90% attitude and willingness to take part. 10% skill. And if you're a tier one civilian, that might amp up somewhat because you need a variety of skills. But the bottom line of dealing with violence is, understand people only treat you the way you let them. If you want to be able to deal with it, you've got to get your head right. You've got to be willing to be worse than them in that moment. That doesn't mean I'm a bad soul. It just means I've got an alter ego compartmentalized somewhere in the back of my brain who's down a fucking long corridor inside an iron door that's padlocked on a chain. And when I need him, I can let him off and I've got complete control of him. So I'm talking about cold clinical access of aggression that you switch on like a light switch, deal with the fucking problem and switch it back off like an attack trained war dog. What I'm not talking about is red mist where you just get angry and you lose the plot. The whole thing is, it's very important that you control your emotional state throughout the entire spectrum of a violent incident. And it's also very important that I access the most useful emotional state. So what would be the best emotional state that you could be in before, during, and after a fight dynamic? Well, imagine it like a game, Call of Duty, right? So you've got the, the, your character and you can spend money accumulated on getting in better body armor, better weapons. Are you on the same page? Mm -hmm. Right. But instead of the physical attributes, because he's already got that, he's a badass, he's trained, he's good. What mental component would you give him? What would be most essential and most useful and most conducive to prevailing that violent incident? Well, first of all, would be the mindset and the fucking willingness to take part. So if I've only got, if I'm only willing to do whatever's necessary to survive and survive is my ultimate outcome, well, if I don't survive, I'm dead. There's nowhere to go with it. So I need to go beyond survival. I'd be willing to do whatever it takes to win. And really, there ain't no winning in violence, but by winning, I mean, I prevail. I'm the one that goes home and you're the one that don't. So I need to be willing to do whatever it takes in order to prevail, right? And what will I implement in order for me to make that happen? Well, I'll implement the gift from our creator, which is righteous indignation. I understand what righteous indignation is. It's a gift from your creator to stand up against all wrongdoing. So if somebody wanted to end your life simply because they felt they had the right, should you be pissed off about that? Fuck yes, you should be pissed off about that. If somebody wants to do something to you that violates you in a, in, in, in a worse way, whether it's your freedoms or whatever the fuck it is, should you have indignation about that? Yes, you fucking should. So righteous indignation, the willingness to stand up and fight for what's important to me. I'm not going to fight over petty shit. I'm going to fight over what's important for me. So... I will feel adrenaline flood my body, but rather than capitulate through fear that I could get hurt, I'm literally outraged that you would fucking have the audacity to present a threat that threatens to take me away from everything I love and everything I love away from me. How fucking dare you? So righteous indignation is you step to the fucking scratch if you want to die, because I'm fucking willing. That's the indignation. That's the mindset part, right? Yeah, you can't give somebody that. They've got to, they've got to really become self-aware. Right. They've got to really look into it. So one, one method I give them is to contemplate loss. So I say, imagine you've been training all this self-protection stuff for two years. You're getting pretty good. You've done a few simulations, a few scenarios. You look a bit of a badass with all the T-shirts and blah, blah, blah. Ask yourself, if you found yourself in a critical incident, let's say two armed subjects in an alley tonight, could you really handle it? Well, if you got past the bravado and the ego to the point where they're on their own in the changing room thinking about it, people, oh, actually, you know? well, that's what people don't address. People don't address that. They, 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 they train in this stuff. And then when they actually find themselves in a situation for real, there's this sudden dawning. Fuck, this is real. I could get hurt. Oh, well, fuck yeah, you could get hurt. You know, all consequences of violence are nasty. What are we simulating? We are simulating violence when we train. It's a dark arm. In which case, you're training to deal with that. You, you need to know yourself. So let's say then that this hypothetical person that's stopped in an alley gets challenged and robbed. He maybe gives up his money and he tries to leave. He can't leave and he freezes and he can't fight effectually and he ends up dead. 
Well, from a personal point of view, that person's life's over. He's never going to see another full moon. He's never going to see another sunset or sunrise. He's never going to eat another tasty meal. He's never going to kiss the people he loves. He's never going to lay down again with a woman. He's never going to take another holiday. He's never going to achieve another goal. He's never going to do fuck all. It's over. You've lost everything. So how would you feel about that? Well, unfortunately, many people can't even find the righteous indignation within themselves to stand up for themselves, even if they've lost everything. So then I suggest, well, why don't you contemplate loss from your perspective? So you've got significant other, right? That's a hypothetical person. He's got a wife and he's got three kids. You know, nice house, business, phone, business, friends, blah, blah, blah. Right. I want you to imagine, if you will, the day that, you know, the moment that the cops knock on the door and she opens the door and they say, Madam, I'm sorry to inform you that your husband was stabbed to death. Picture her face in that moment. How would she like take a sharp and take your breath? How would her skin coloration change because the blood drains? How would she suddenly go into shock because she's no longer cognitive? What pained expression would she have on her face? How would she feel? Well, if you now think, you know, about that for sure, you know, you, your brain will give you what you ask for if you, you visualize intently enough, you would see that she's pained. And then imagine it's been 24 hours, she's hyster hysterical, you know, her kids that stay with her mother. Now, 48 hours later, she's just plucked up the courage, she's going to tell your kids, daddy's gone. Imagine their little faces, imagine how fucking shit upset and, and hysterical they'll probably be. How does that make you feel? So if you try to encourage somebody to do this exercise, you know, they'll just, they won't go and do it. So I'm not telling, I'm not telling them to do it as I'm telling them it, I'm telling them to go away and implement some self-awareness, you know, and ask yourself, if you contemplated loss of you, is that enough? And if not, imagine the contemplation of loss so far, right? So the children are really upset. Now let's fast forward three months. Well, you were the breadwinner, so no money's coming in, so now the house is getting repossessed. Now your family can't afford to live where they live, so now they're going to a shitty area and the kids are going to a shit school. Six months down, and you've managed to settle for less, you know, Kids are resilient, you know, they, they still think about daddy, but they're resilient, so they're laughing and smiling again. Year down the road, well, your wife's been faithful up to now, but she's got a life, so now she lies down with someone else at night. How would that mean? And you go through this entire sequence, and what you'll find if somebody does it is, first of all, they start to get emotional. You know, if they're not the hollow man, they start to get emotional and they get upset. And if they keep doing it because they're, oh, I don't want to do that, if you encourage them to keep going, that upsetness becomes righteous indignation because what i'll do somewhere in the in inside of that um, emotional conditioning drill if you like i'll say well, i'm going to pause and i'm going to remind you that all of that loss on your level and their level happened because of these two fucking miscreants in the alley that night that had a blade that you shit yourself and couldn't fucking deal with even though you'd be pretending to be john wick in your crab bagar class for the last 18 months you couldn't put it together on the night, and that's your loss. How do you feel about that now? What would you say to these two cunts if you see them again? And I go, oh, no, no, no. And you use the analogy, right? So I understand we're using visualization, mental imagery, and we're just playing it. So using your imagination, you know, they say that by the age of seven, you, you, you lose your imagination. Well, I wasn't indoctrinated, so I never got mine lost. I've always been Peter Pan in my head, right? And you're virtual reality simulator between your ears is the best training tool that you've got so you could picture this whole situation now imagine hypothetically because this is just a simulation in your head right that we use the etch-a-sketch analogy do you remember the etch-a-sketch yep so you have an etch-a-sketch toy and if you draw something with like a styro pen and if it's shit you just like wipe it and you get another go or you shake it and you get another go etch-a-sketch right imagine that analogy and I say to you, right, you've contemplated your response failed when you dealt with these two individuals because you didn't think about it. You didn't have the emotional response on the subconscious data bank file that was prepared for that level of violence and, and malevolence. And you couldn't deal with it. You froze. So you couldn't deal with it then. But now you know what it caused. And now you know the loss it caused to you and the loss it caused to them. So by magic, we're going to etch a sketch and I'm going to rewind you right back so you get one more go to deal with that situation in the fucking alley. Well, ideally, of course, if you could have avoided it, you would. But let's say you can't and you're a cornered animal. Well, I ask you, how much more 
sheer fucking tenacity and savagery could you pull out of yourself in order to create a different result? I'll put it to you that you could find it within you. So this kind of mental conditioning and visualization rehearsal is in conjunction with combatives training. And you need that self-awareness. And the questions that you want to ask yourself are this. What is it about life that you love that you really want to live for? Well, for me, it's my family, my children, my wife, my dog, where I live, people in my life, my students, my friends, my world. I love my life. You know, but for all these stupid fucking restrictions, I love my life. And I want to live for that. Well, what would you be willing to stand up, be counted, and fight for that? Everything I love. I would stand up and I would fight for that. What would you be willing to risk your life and potentially die for? That. And what would you be willing to, without hesitation, kill for? That. So you've got to identify what's fucking important to you. That's drawing your line in the sand. Do you understand? You've got to know what you're willing for. Now your training takes shape and purpose. Now innately, you're a, you're a peaceful human being because the most dangerous warriors I've ever met are gentlemen. Once you know you can do it, it's the last thing you ever want to do. It really is. But it's there. And it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Right. Well, and really, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. So you see is a collective implementation of combative skills and a suggestion of research in others so that you can become the best self-protection trainee that you can be. And it's also cultivating the willingness, the mental conditioning, you know, and having that willingness just to be giving yourself that permission where context dictates by content, you know, <laughs> the green light in order to do that. If I'm forced to fight and use any of the things I've just spoken about, it was out of an act of sheer desperation. And it was, what that means is if I didn't do that, I lose it, everything. My, my world's gone, and that's not happening. That's not happening. I'll stand up and fight till the end. So there's nothing left to fight about. As long as there's breath in my fucking body, I'll fight. In fact, you know, if there's a, I'll still fight five minutes after I'm declared clinically dead. If I can twitch, I'll fight. That's mindset. You know? And without that, it's not combatives, because that's what makes combatives combatives. Without that, it's martial arts in jeans. No, I don't teach martial arts in jeans. So the biggest, comb what combatives is really, is at the extreme end of the self-protection scale and the black sheep of the family for a reason. It's to deal with it, the extreme. Real threat, if I'm facing a real threat to life, there's a massive threat disparity. So multiple assailants against one person, stronger, larger, aggressive male against a woman, uh, multiple arm threat against a man or a woman, a you know, large aggressive person against a smaller adult, et cetera, et cetera. There's a disparity. You know, well, if that person's going to end you, you know, you, you got to do your utmost in order to prevail. You, you have the God-given right to defense of self. And what fuels that is the tool of righteous indignation. And of course, that's what's been pacified out of everyone with what they put in the food, what they put in the water, what they put in the oxygen, what they put in the soil. You know, they bred it out. Look at modern man over the last two decades. Look at him now, it was beta soy boy. Seriously. Many people think the same thing. They just got the balls to stand up and say it. And like I said to you, you know, you might want to edit some of this interview out. Oh, no, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not. No, dude, dude, this is the easiest right. interview I've ever had in my life. Um, <laughs> this is great. Every leading question I had, you already took care of, which I'm not surprised. I think one of the things that the reason I wanted people to hear from you is for the very, your, your last statement, um, your upbringing as unfortunate as it was in a lot of ways. I mean, I, you know, no, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I had a similar situation with having to move a lot. So I know that aspect of it. I didn't have the violence at home that you had. Um, but I did have to deal with new people and all that. So I understand partially being a military kid, that aspect of it. But what's so awesome is you've been able to take that and you've been able to turn it into something and give people mm. something that very few people are going to experience. But you, just in what you, just in this last hour or so that we've been going, you've outlined for people how to get it without having to live it. 
er, early yeah. on and how to develop yeah. it. Yeah. And that's that's worth its weight in gold. It's absolutely worth its weight in gold. I don't understand. I don't see, people don't understand how valuable what you just said is and how important developing your mind correctly. Because you can have all the tools in the world. You can look great. You can move. But if you don't have it up here, it's not going to be there for you when you need it. And I, I haven't heard anybody put it as succinctly as you just put it. And it was just fun listening to you like, and, and yeah, the way you put it that. out. I mean, one thing to look at from a self-protection point of view is a model that was used. It was developed by a guy called John Lofty Wiseman, who fought a 22 SAS. And it was a model that depicted um, self-protection. It's called the vital pyramid. So like any pyramid, it's the base is the most important. At the base of the pyramid, you've got mindset, yeah. which is basically what I talked about, the willingness to fucking take part regardless of the outcome it's all pre-written fuck it i'm just going to give you the best performance i can that willingness which takes you past those psychological hurdles of will i get hurt will this happen blah 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 fuck it at that mindset i don't want to live forever you know i'm willing to take part and i believe we go on but within this realm i don't want to live forever so mindset is willingness but knowing what you're willing for like i said you need that self-analysis then you know without any hesitation or doubt the next would be tactics well, the tactics that I give any civilian is what's called the UC game plan. And the game plan is basically awareness as its pivotal thing. Uh, situational control, preemption, continuous attack and escape in its worst case. The best use of the game plan is awareness leading straight to escape, which meant I was aware and I was switched on where I was. I saw this potential situation unfolding, so I turned around and I went the other way. Awareness leading to escape, right? So I would have a tactical plan of action where possible I'm switched on enough to recognize a problem before it becomes a problem. If any student of self-protection, particularly a tier one level, there should be no fucking excuses. You've got no excuses texting on your phone with the ear pods in. So your whole world is this cone and you're developing this tech neck kind of thing. The phone is designed to detach you and switch you off from the outer surroundings. Because as you know, the predatory optic favors three things. Predatory optic is what does a criminal find most useful in terms of attributes displayed by you physically or emotionally that would dictate to him you're a good victim? First one would be um, weakness in some way. So physical impairment, walking with a limp, or but more psychological weakness. You're looking at the ground, you move very slowly, your whole body language says externally, your representational system externally says you're not confident. You're not switched on, you're not alert, you're, not, you're, you're, you're a little bit delicate. That's a very attractive um, thing for a criminal. So the first one would be some sort of weakness. Next would be, are they switched off? Are they detached from the herd? Are they, like most people, fucking earbuds in, texting on the phone, fixated? living inside their head, not outside their head, because that's very attractive to a criminal also. And then the final element would be a, a person is alone. So somebody looks weak, switched off and alone, it's like Christmas. Do you know what I mean? That's victim selection. So what can you take from that? Well, you know, if you have some things that outwardly represent you in a less than confident way, how could you fix them? How could you make yourself from a, a develop a confident body language profile that says to that person you're a potentially harder target? do that so you know that would just be be one way the other would be you know don't be switched off if you like say if you're a tier one civilian you find yourself in this altercation and that's the perfect place to stop for part two because now we're going to get into the final uh, part three is going to really wrap everything up talking about you know the current state of the world why it's more important than ever to have this information and again, you know, I hope you guys are getting, I hope you understand that, uh, you know, I've been getting some, some things, some fantastic, uh, feedback on this. You guys really, some of you guys said you, you feel like you're watching a Guy Ritchie, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, movie, uh, scene from one. And, and I get that, you know, it's, it's the accent, the South London accent, but the authenticity is just coming through, you know, on all of us. And, and I would absolutely you know, look at all the links, make sure you get to Urban Combatives, make sure you check out Lee's stuff. He's got tons of great content, just great books. He's got a YouTube channel. All the links are down there. But, you know, what's interesting is a lot of you said, oh, well, you know, you say that too, or you say it this way, or you guys, the, it, the goal of the channel is to give you 
the best information I can possibly find from the best people I can possibly find. It is not the Tim Larkin channel for only Tim Larkin thoughts because that would be boring as hell and it'd be a freaking infomercial. Um, listen, I, you're not going to only have one source up on you know your bookshelf or in your video libraries. You're going to have lots of information. And I want to make sure that I give you access to the best people that are there. Yes. Do we say things similarly? Yes, we do. But again, the way Lee says it might actually resonate with some of you better than the way I say it. Um, and that's why I bring it. I actually like the way he brings up some of these things. He says them a lot more uh, uh, just colorfully than I do. Um, I, I really appreciate that. And I, I hope uh, I can get my travel ban li uh, lifted so I can get over there and, and actually spend some time with Lee because he's a good dude. Um, but anyways, I'm looking forward. I hope you like this. Uh, remember guys, get over to surviveviolence.com. Put this up here for you. Um, get your free masterclass, share it with everybody, share the channel. The reason I'm able to do this is because you guys are supporting it. And, um, you're also word of mouth has been incredible, uh, on the growth of this channel. And, uh, I, I just truly, truly appreciate it. So, um, part three will be coming up very soon. And I've got a lot of other content in the can coming that I think you're going to really like. So stick with us.